Hey everybody, welcome to John Wayne Airport. I am Bill and if you've seen any of my videos, you recognize this plane. This is Brad's freaking awesome Bonanza. It's an A36 and I've wanted to do this for, for a long time and that's get Brad to give us a little tour of this plane, walk around and, and nerd out a bit about what makes this, in my opinion, the best general aviation plane of all time. And there he is. Hi. Just like the plane, you know Brad if you've seen any of my videos. Hopefully only by reputation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Brad has a really cool yak, which is right there. Uh, the Cardinal, which is missing, that usually sits right there. We just dropped that off to get its annual. Uh, check that video out on the channel as well. But this is, this is your baby though, I would imagine. It is, yeah. This is my pride and joy. And uh, this was the first airplane I owned and the one that I'm intending to never get rid of. Um, I'm hoping to be the last owner of this plane. Okay, so Brad, give us the, the nerd out intro to this plane. Year, uh, the model. We need like, like a, a red light recording in progress. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Just have, yeah. have our buddies in the tower. It's like, it's like there's an airport around here yeah. or something. We could do something about this airplane noise. Yeah. Okay, so so the, the general spec yeah. nerd out. Yeah, so this is a 1978 A36 Bonanza. Uh, this one has been modified to have a Continental IO 550B engine up front. They normally come with the IO 520 engine. So this one's 300 horsepower versus the factory standard 285. Uh, the result of that is it's about 10 knots faster faster than a standard 1978 and it climbs about 200 feet per minute better. Uh, I can cruise at a higher altitude, I don't because it's kind of impractical to do so, but I have a little bit higher cruise altitude than a, uh, than a 285 horsepower one as well. Uh, this particular airplane is exceptionally light. Most A36s are about 150 to 200 pounds heavier than this one, uh, but I've gone to a lot of effort to make it as light as possible while still preserving the CG location so that I can put as many people in it as I, I want. So uh, we'll get to the back in a second, but that's kind of the top line on it. Um, it's about 180 knot airplane burning about 16 gallons an hour. So the miles per gallon is actually pretty good compared to other airplanes. Uh, my useful load is just shy of 1,400 pounds with the doors on and a little over 1,450 with the doors off. Some proper nerd out specs. <laughs> So when yeah. you say that the engine's bigger, yeah. is the engine physically bigger or is it just a displacement, like stroke bore kind of scenario? The, so it has a slightly bigger displacement. Um, the Ooh, cylinders yeah. are just ever so slightly bigger uh, on the, the 300 horse instead of the 285. So uh, again, IO 550B instead of an IO 520. So about uh, 30, what is that? 30 cubic inches different. I mean, you still have like some room to play with here. Yeah, know? so this is the, the amount of room I have here is a result of the panel that's in it. Um, the standard IO, or I'm sorry, the standard A36 with the factory vacuum gauges and things like that, and the factory engine gauges, uh, all of this is taken up by hoses and tubing and, and gyros and such. Um, so this all, whole area here is usually occupied. That's not standard for a... Uh, 36 series. But Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was, I, I don't remember seeing that much stuff there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, it looks like it's a huge hole. Yep. Yeah. So normally it's not quite as roomy up front. Um, and if you were to pull this panel off and look back here, there's only like five or six actual wire bundles back there compared to the Hornet's nest that's behind a lot of uh, a lot of older airplanes. So uh, this being a 1978 airplane, the avionics were done in 2023. So I'm still, you know, keeping it as modern as possible and, and updating it as I fly it. So my theory behind it is to make it the airplane that I want to fly for as long as possible and to be able to go places with it without really having to think about it and uh, with as low of a workload as possible. So. Um, the idea is get to a thousand feet, turn the autopilot on, let it run all the way there and wherever I want to turn it off on the way, uh, on the descent in or on the approach or what have you, I can. Um, I do a lot of long distance flying with this plane, so it was really important to be able to be hands off with it. And this was a result of that whole thing, having the open space here. And uh, we'll take a look at the, at the avionics, but how much weight did that remove off of the front of the airplane there? So just putting the panel in it, um, 
I removed the vacuum system, we removed the old gauges, we removed a lot of wiring and things like that. Uh, the total weight change was 107 pounds. Uh, the airplane lost 107 pounds out of the Jeez. nose and behind the panel, uh, just with old wires and things like that in the vacuum system as well. Um, I had uh, two GI-275s in it before I put the new panel in. The shop that installed those declined to remove the vacuum system, so I was flying around with a vacuum system in the airplane that didn't do anything for about two years, uh, or actually close to three years. So uh, that came out as well when the, the most recent panel uh, went into it. And was that the first dual GI-275 install in the country, if not the world? I was told that we were the second customer installation. This was the 172 uh, number one? I don't know which airframe it was in particular, but we were the second customer installation. So there were a couple mm -hmm. other airplanes floating around with it, demo yeah. planes, certification yeah, platforms, yeah. things like that. Um, but I was told we were the second customer installation. Yeah, so we that. bought 275s from Garmin the day they were announced. Um, and the funny thing was, is that morning I was going to put in an order for the King KI300 attitude indicator. I had approval from the previous owner because the, the back, I've been flying this plane since 2017, but I've only owned it since 2021. So this was in 2020 i got approval from the previous owner um, to go and, and put a new panel in it because our attitude indicator was failing so um, we had approval to do the ki 300 and literally that morning garmin announces the 275 and i called him back and said hey let's do this instead so we ordered it that day it was in the shop about three weeks later to, to get those 275s so a, a segue on uh, to the to the back of the airplane with the weight removed from the nose mm -hmm. is there any any issue with the length of this plane having a having the forward weight pulled out? Um, short answer is no in practice. Uh, it does depend how I load the airplane, how many people, how much fuel I'm carrying, things like that. Uh, on rare occasion, if I'm really putting a lot of people and stuff in the airplane, then it certainly can. Uh, but with how I normally fly it, usually it's no more than myself plus three people. Um, I've had myself plus five. I've, I've had the airplane full, uh, but that's very rare. And when that happens, generally people don't have baggage, so I don't have to worry about moving the CG aft and things like that. So, and I'm big enough that I keep the CG pretty far forward when I'm up front. Uh, so it works out pretty well. Uh, for a normal sized person with normal sized passengers, you're probably gonna be limited to four people plus the pilot uh, with baggage. And more realistically, it's gonna be pilot plus three. All right, so this is definitely the business end of, yeah. of the A36, but what I think is the most unique part, nothing can be most unique. It's either unique or not. <laughs> what makes the A36 my favorite general aviation plane um, is not the engine, but it's the, um, the cabin. Yeah. The fact that this has got club seating yep. and what are these doors called what's the what's the the term beachcraft calls them the aft utility doors aft which utility is a doors. fair name for them honestly yeah. um both of these doors are removable in about five minutes um all of the seats are quick quick removable without any tools it's all just pins and things like that to pull them so uh, i can convert this plane from a cross-country traveler to a photo platform in about five minutes I'm going to insert some B-roll probably of taking these doors off, but it's remarkable how quickly you can do that yeah. and how you can turn yeah. this plane into a photo platform. But this, the, the usability, so what, it, what are the considerations for the seat configurations? So you can pull them out, right? Do you need like certain weight and balance changes? Yeah, so anytime you make a change to an airplane more than a pound, theoretically, you need a new weight and balance. Uh, there are a lot of owners that don't do that, but because of how much flying I do, and because it's the right thing to do, I have a separate weight and balance for this plane with the doors on there. Look at that takeoff. That's gotta be a go around, little, right? No, that's a takeoff. Good Lord, that's yeah, like the old that's, school that's noise abatement. That's the San Francisco flight. <laughs> just empty yeah. and just, good yeah. Lord, that was hilarious. Yeah. They're just at the departure end and already at 3,000 feet. Yep. Okay, anyway. Anyway, so, um, yeah, so if you change the weight of the airplane, uh, furnishings, equipment, things like that, by more than a pound, 
uh, then you need to have a new weight and balance for it. And that comes down to permanent changes to it. In other words, not things that are suction cupped or clipped or anything like that, but you know, actual structural changes to the airplane. So um, I have a uh, weight and balance that is created for this plane uh, that I carry with me with the door kit to remove them. And uh, it, it includes both of the rear seats removed as well as the, uh, the doors here. Um, if I leave one of the seats installed when I'm flying around, so one of the aft seats installed when I'm flying around with the doors off, I'll add 17 pounds to whoever's sitting in it because that's the weight of the seat. So um, I can do that on the fly in that regard. So what it like the configuration though, like what, what do most A36 owners kind of set this up as? So this is the full club with, yep. with the four back here, which is really nice. And it actually is kind of nice to have, you know, if you're sitting here, have something to put stuff on. If you're sitting here, have something to put stuff on. Yeah. But so leg room. It's limited. It, right. But if you remove one or the other, yep. it's going to be a lot more. So yeah. Yeah. So, um, most most A36 owners will fly with all four seats installed in the airplane in the back. Um, some people will remove this seat here um, and fly with just three in the back. Uh, that helps with baggage and things like that, particularly with older A36s. Um, Pre-1979, there's no baggage compartment back here, and pardon the leather hanging down. This is the result of a photo shoot I did. Um, So anyway, um, most, most pre-1979 A36s don't have this baggage compartment. Uh, the actual like wall is here. That's where it stops. And that's how it was for the first five years that I was flying the airplane. Um, we installed this baggage compartment when it came out uh, a couple months ago or a couple years ago uh, to allow basically the same post-79 baggage compartment back here. But where I was going with that is that pre-79 owners will frequently remove one or both of these seats to put baggage there because the only other storage space you have in the airplane is between the forward and middle row of seats. Uh, and that also has a weight limitation in there. But realistically, it's actually a space problem because if you put a single suitcase in there, it's going to push on the backs of the seats. And it's kind of uncomfortable, especially for people who are tall like Bill and I. Sweet. Well, that I really, you know, before I knew much about this plane, the fact that you could fit four people in the back here was really, really cool. And to me, makes it more of a traveling plane not to you know anything bad about any yeah. other airframes but like you know cirrus is super comfortable but they don't have you know the club seating in the back yeah. this this is really cool yeah the cirrus was designed with the owner pilot in mind uh, as was the 33 and 35 series beechcraft airplanes uh, the 36 was the first one that was really designed with somebody other than the owner pilot in mind um, so when the beach family was creating the plane in 1968 they figured, yeah, there might be an owner pilot up front, but maybe his family's in the back or his kids or business partners or what have you. Um, and then they extended that to uh, basically be, okay, well, what if there's a professional pilot flying the airplane and then you have, you know, the aircraft owner in the back and things like that. So in some of the later models, you'll have a table back here and cup holders and things like that. So the table was removed in this one before I, I came to, to be in And that, that's kind of like no one uses it too much or you didn't use it and it's just heavy? It's heavy, yeah. Um, I think the table assembly is something like 15 or 20 pounds or something like that. So. And that just goes kind of right with the Yeah, you can, see, you can see the holes on the side there. So when the table was removed, the, uh, the holes were never patched at some point i'm going to get a couple buttons to stick in those but uh yeah so it, it was removed before uh we took possession of the airplane back in 2017. all right well i think everyone's waiting to see the business up front. up front yeah i love it when you talk avionics so yeah <laughs> Yeah, we'll we'll try to show as much as we can i took some b-roll on the flight we just did um but the uh you know obviously batteries are a concern. You can turn them off. That's fine. The G3X is still waking up, as is the 275. Do something. Hit continue. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
wait for the Ahars to wake up. Okay. All right, so obviously this is quite upgraded <laughs> from different. standard. Yeah, uh, what I've got is... some pictures of what it looked like when I first started flying it too. It's it's very different. Yeah, it's crazy. Yep. So what's what's from the overall perspective, what was the um, the methodology here? Yeah, so the goal is workload reduction. Um, the airplane originally had a, well, not originally, but when I took possession of it, it had a King KFC 200 autopilot in it. Um, that KFC 200 also had a yaw damper, which was an operative for the entire time that I had been flying the airplane. Uh, but it did okay. The, uh, the King KFC 200 is really good for cruising. It's not great for climbing, descending, or flying approaches, or at least mine wasn't. So uh, the primary point of replacement that I wanted was the autopilot. So this is the Garmin GFC 500 autopilot. Um, I have some friends at Garmin who I kind of ran it by because this is one of the only airplanes that's certified for both the GFC 500 and the GFC 600 autopilot. Um, I ran I ran the uh, 500 versus 600 conversation by some friends at Garmin. They told me it was the same servos between that and all the way up to the GFC 700, which is the autopilot for the G1000, which is installed all the way up to Citations and Kinger uh, 350 and stuff like that. So it's the same servos, so there's no real concern about uh, control actuation and leverage and things like that and the ability to, to use smaller servos or any such nonsense. Uh, but the GFC 500 is significantly cheaper for a more or less the same feature set as the GFC 600. So I went with the GFC 500 instead. Um, I paired that with the Garmin G3X. Originally I was going to keep both Garmin GI 275s. You can see one of those to the left of it. That's the, the one remaining from the, the previous panel. Um, the G3X is the brain for the autopilot, basically. It's also my primary flight instruments and, and things like that. Uh, it's a touch screen. That's a split screen configuration at the moment. It's actually just one piece of glass. It's, it's the whole single unit. And that is be, responsive as hell. Yeah, it can be flown in either split or full screen, the full screen buttons at the top right. Um, oh, but I typically so nice. fly it with split screen. Um, what I've found with that G3X which I didn't anticipate, but has been very helpful, uh, is the added situational awareness for it, or that you receive from it. Um, being able to just look at airspace at a glance, terrain, things like that, with both a forward-looking and a top-down picture with the synthetic vision and such. Um, it's really, really nice. Uh, the other thing the G3X gives you is redundancy. So the left concentric knob there also allows me to manipulate the uh, autopilot controls so I can set heading and altitude and things like that with that or with the actual controls on the, the autopilot head. Um, so it's really nice to be able to do that. Um, you can touch the heading bug, the blue number there, oh, to there. also okay. type it in or anything oh, like cool. that. Um, so you can set, you know, whatever, no, whatever heading you want. 800 is not going to do you a whole lot of good. How though. do you do zero eight zero? What the heck? Zero? Just 80. Eight. Yep. yep. Oh, eight. oh, eight. I got it. Yeah. yeah. Um, it omits the leading zero. If got not it. Hard. Okay. So. Yeah, it's yep. cool that the autopilot is controlled from that too. And obviously yeah. you just hit, you can center push it from the there. Yep. And same thing with the altitude selector. You can push the sink altitude too. Yeah, that's really um, nice. The GFC 500 also has a automatic level button. Um, I think that's a really cool idea for lower, lower time pilots, particularly pilots without an instrument rating, because that'll get you out of a jam. Um, and you can put the airplane into a pretty significant upset attitude, hit the level button, and it'll fly itself out. Uh, which is pretty impressive. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen it do it. I, I haven't done it in this airplane because I haven't really had a need to. Um, but I have seen it in demos, and it is very impressive. And I'm, I'm a big fan of that button being there. That's uh, cool. Probably save a couple lives over the course of the lifespan of the product. So. Yeah, that's really cool. Yep. Okay, so um, next, so kind, maybe maybe it makes controversial. Sense to go left first, actually. Oh, left. Okay, yeah. we'll go left. So that's the Garmin GI 275. Um, when we were talking about the first avionics update we did to the airplane, that's what we put in it. Uh, we put two of those in there. Actually, these are so cool. Yeah, I love that unit. Um, the only reason I got rid of it is because I had a reason to get a G3X. I was working as a consultant on something uh, that led me to need a G3X, basically. Um, but it doubled as a, an autopilot interface and situational awareness, and I'm glad I did it. Um, I've been thinking about it anyway. But Do you ever leave it? I, I, I don't recall seeing it in any other um, position, but since you've got the attitude, you know, the, the G3X, do you ever leave it in something other than the backup no. ADI? No, I leave it as the ADI. Um, when that one was repurposed, we uh, we actually just um, 
Hang on, sorry, I was reading the text. Uh, when that one was repurposed, they unlocked it. So it used to be locked as an ADI. Um, now it has the other pages, but it's just a backup ADI, so there's really no reason to, to move it to another page. All the other information I could want is on the, the G3X anyway. So. And do you need that as a backup for the G3X? You don't need a 275 specifically. Um, if you want to fly the airplane IFR, then you do need some sort of backup instrumentation, either round gauges, G5, uh, mid-continent SAM, or what have you. So uh, you need some sort of alternate uh, source of information for the attitude, airspeed, and altimeter. So the 275 does all those things. Cool. Okay, yeah. so we got Garmin, 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 yep. friends at Garmin. What is that doing here? So this is an Avidyne IFD 440. A um, little bit of background on me. Back when I was in college, I worked for a uh, avionics, well, I worked for an FBO I, as a flight instructor, which was uh, partnered with an avionics shop. That avionics shop was an Avidyne dealership. Um, I fell in love with these units. They're awesome. Uh, I, I really do like the Avidynes. Uh, my only qualm, or not qualm, but my only qualifier that I usually give with the Avidynes is you need to give it about 10 hours to get used to it. Once you're past those 10, 10 hours and using it and uh, getting comfortable with it, I think they're superior to the Garmin products as far as capability and, and UI and things like that. They don't have um, watches though. They don't have watches. There's no flashlight installed on this either. Um, but that's not to say Garmin products are not good, because I love them. Obviously, I, I have many Garmin products in the airplane. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the IFD 440 was my preference uh, over the, the Garmin's. Uh, this airplane originally had a, again, originally, when I first got it, had a GNS 430 WAS, uh, the old mainstay of the Garmin fleet from basically 97 to 2019. Um, the IFD 440 is designed to be a slide in replacement for the GNS 430 WAS. Uh, and it is very effective at that. When we replaced the 430 WAS and went to the 440, the total install time was five minutes and 26 seconds. I timed it. So you just pull it out, put it in, that's it. Uh, didn't require any reconfiguration, no reset up, no rewiring, nothing like that. So this is sitting in the 430 WAS tray, same using the 430 WAS antenna, all the wiring, everything like that. So um, it is really simple and really easy to go between them, which Sweet. is nice. Okay, now this this big boy right yeah. here, this is this is a cool toy. Yep, yeah. So that's a JP Instruments EDM 930. Um, one of the fir actually the first change I made to it when I bought the airplane from the previous owner in 2021 uh, was I installed this engine gauge uh, system or this electronic engine monitor, digital engine monitor. That's the the way they want to say it. Um, my theory with that is that the money it costs to install it. If I can run the engine for another 300 to 400 hours because of it, beyond its planned TBO, it has paid for itself. Um, and so far it has been a huge, huge, huge factor in keeping the engine ha happy and healthy. Um, I've got some really clean engine reports with oil analysis and compressions and bore scopes and things like that. I attribute a lot of that to, to that. Um, having that kind of data available is super important and really helpful. So uh, yeah, I, I quite like this, uh, this EDM 930. Um, that is the top line product from JPI for a single engine airplane. There's an EDM 960, which is for a twin engine airplane, but uh, the 930 is the top of the line product from, from JPI for singles. Um, it's phenomenal. When I put the G3X in, I had considered putting the Garmin engine monitoring system, the IS, uh, in the G3X and decided not to simply because I love that JPI so much. Um, the other nice thing about the JPI is that it has a data port, has a, a USB port if I can get the thing out. Um, so I can download all of the engine data and have it analyzed and things like that. Um, cool. Or look at it on JPI system. And this records or has the ability to record uh, data point up to every one second. So that's why um, it can record all of those data points to a one second thing. So you can see an instantaneous or almost instantaneous trend. Is that uh, is that kind of like the standard readout of that or is that configurable? Uh, it's a little bit configurable, but that's pretty much how all of them are set up. Yeah. Um, the only two things I can think of for how they would change it is this fuel quantity or the fuel gauges here. You can show or hide the digits if you just want the tapes. And then the fuel used, which you'll see cycling down here, the fuel used with the totalizer, you can reset that between trips or between fill-ups. 
looks gorgeous, and yeah. the the panel cut out and the you know the the paint they yep. did at the, yeah, the did shop an awesome did a really job. good job. Um, it's not done yet. I'm still missing a couple components. Uh, there's going to be USB ports on each side. Those are the GSB 15s from Garmin that are going to be going there. Um, and then this transponder is going to get replaced for the GTX 345, which is ADS-B in and out. Uh, and it interfaces with the, uh, the Garmin G3X. So uh, I'll be able to have traffic and weather and things like that on uh, the G3X, which I don't currently have because I don't have the transponder yet. And my favorite upgrade on this panel is this button right here. <laughs> This used to just be a little razor, live. little razor blade. Oh, it is yep. live. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, ground. Um, that used to be like a little razor blade that would just jam you right in the yep. thumb. And I will have you know, I specifically requested a new button <laughs> when we redid this panel because it was so annoying to run that button over here. Yeah. Um, that I, I, I just made a comment offhand to my buddy who runs the avionics shop who installed this. Um, and I was Enhanced like, arrow. Yeah. Southern Illinois. Uh, and I was like, hey, can can I get do you? what's the process for getting a new button? He's like, oh, I got one on the shelf if you want. <laughs> sure, puts the thing on there and that's that. So, um, yeah, so Enhanced Arrow and, and Carbondale, Illinois I did this for me. Um, you can see there's their, their logo and everything like that. So Rob Nelson owns the shop out there. Uh, long time friend. Um, we used to fly together when he was a student pilot back when I was teaching in Illinois. So, uh, long time friend, happy to support his business. Um, and soon enough, it'll be all done, and I'll post all the glamour shots and everything like that, and get him some more business going that way. So, uh, really good guy, good people down there. Sweet. Yep. So thank you to Brad for the awesome tour of to. this super cool Bonanza. Yeah. I freaking love this plane. Like it is, I'll do like the little 360 shot again. Um, it's so pretty, but usable and fast and really fun. Like it feels like a fun plane. That's one thing that we didn't touch at all. And that's how the plane flies. Maybe yeah. that's a, another video comment. If you want to see a little bit of a flight review of it, that like it, the wing is amazing. It, it flies and feels smooth and capable. Yeah. It's like light on the controls, but it, but it feels hefty. Over -engineered. Yeah. It feels it's hefty. Like strong. when we were landing, um, like in the small planes, the wake turbulence and jet blast from the jets, you, you like tense up a little bit more. This plane makes you feel safer, if that even is a thing. Um, but amazing flying plane, but I love all the details of it that make it, in my opinion, again, the best general aviation yeah, plane. It's pretty special. Yeah, in the world. So thanks guys. Um, yeah, comment below if you have any questions for Brad on the Bonanza, and maybe we'll do a follow-up on some you know other components if, uh, if there's any interest. So there you go. Thanks, Brad. You bet. Happy to. Uh, gimbal. There we go. <laughs> See ya.